37-year-old mother of five, Rachel Morin, went for a jog in Bel Air, Maryland on August 5th, but never returned home. She was reported missing that night. The following day, her remains were discovered under horrific circumstances. Law enforcement officials are staying tight-lipped on the details surrounding Rachel's death, but the case has been deemed a violent homicide. And while no suspects have been identified, authorities are interviewing those closest to Rachel. Tonight, what we know about Rachel Morin and the mystery of what happened to her on that trail. Good evening to you and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Julie Grant in tonight for Vinnie Politan. We begin this evening in Maryland, where a missing person case is now a homicide investigation. We're talking about 37-year-old mother of five, Rachel Morin. She was last seen alive on August 5th. Her body was discovered the next day. Right now, we have more questions than we do answers as to what happened to Rachel. Let's begin, though, with the newest developments. Jeff Hagar with Scripps affiliate WMAR reports. Images of Rachel Morin, the murdered mother of five, now mark the Mon Paw Trail. The Hartford County Sheriff's Office has been inundated with questions surrounding her death, prompting the sheriff to take to social media. One question we have continued to get centers around whether we have interviewed the boyfriend in this case. The answer is yes, we have, along with many other people who are close to Rachel. A modern day whodunit, this case almost immediately attracted the attention of the national media, as well as from outlets from abroad. While the sheriff's office has 78,000 followers on Facebook, posts about Rachel's murder have reached 2 million people. The public hungry for answers is gobbling up coverage of virtually anyone claiming to have information about the case. Basically, when we walked up, we saw fresh blood. And my daughter's boyfriend thought it was deer blood at first. Police say they're frustrated by such people seeking the spotlight. Obviously, uh, there are people out there who are coming up with putting out information in the public that they have no firsthand knowledge of, uh, talking about the crime scene that they have no firsthand knowledge of. Investigators are also concerned about the integrity of the case if details only known to the killer become public, not to mention the impact it could have on Rachel's family. All the false information that's going on out there, um, hearing about possible injuries to her and how this crime occurred, which aren't true, um, has got to make it harder on them. And so people need to think about that when they're out there spreading that kind of information. In Harford County, Jeff Hager, WMAR 2 News. I want to bring in my guest and talk some more about this case. Joining us, is us this evening from Baltimore, Maryland, WMAR anchor Kelly Swoop is with us. And retired NYPD sergeant, the former director of the NYPD Homicide School and the author of two books, The Criminal Investigative Function and The Cold Case Handbook, Joseph Jackalone is with us as well. Uh, Joseph and Kelly, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Let's just start with where things are this evening, the sentiment there uh, in Maryland, in this area, everybody on edge, understandably so. Kelly, let me go to you uh, for that, please. What are you hearing? What are people there saying tonight, please? Julie, a lot of people concerned about their safety. This is a very, very popular park, the Mon Par Trail in a very suburban area, about 35 miles outside of Baltimore. Not a lot of crime in this Harford County community. So police basically stepped up their efforts to ensure people that they were safe but still a lot of questions about what happened to this mom who was actually just there going for a run or a walk and reported missing. And the next day her body was found. And it's, I mean, there've been a couple of memorials and things organized to show support for her and her family. I know the family has an event coming up on Saturday, but just a lot of people want to know whether or not this was an isolated event, where she was targeted. It's just scary for a lot of folks in Harford County right now. Absolutely it is, Kelly, and understandably so. Joseph, let me go to you, please. Kind of help us pull back the curtain. What are investigators doing right now tonight, please? Well, one of the things that we have to look at is cell phone records, internet records, of course, those things play a role in this. See if they can maybe uh, triangulate the uh, cell phone data within where uh, the victim was attacked and see who was in the area at that time. 
you know, as you watch the news releases, uh, they see, you know, it's it's not very populated per se in regards to uh, large sections of the trail. However, there are a lot of developments within that. And one of the things that I would be focusing in on now, and I'm sure the police are too, is if somebody is going to pull off something like this, they have to plan out an escape route. And if you look at the trail, we know that she entered or she parked her car by the William Street entrance of the of the trail. And if you look a little further, about a quarter of a mile where they said that she was attacked, there's a cul-de-sac there. There's also an area that could be, you know, real close, uh, another parking area. So, for instance, if you're going to flee, if you, let's say, you use that cul-de-sac, there might be video surveillance, too. So cell phone records, internet records, and video surveillance, I refer to them as the forensic horsemen. And those things are the things that move forward these cases. And I think that's where investigators are, are, are looking into right now. Joseph, thank you for that. During a press conference, the Harford County Sheriff Jeff Gaylor laid out the details of when Rachel Morin was reported missing, where her car was eventually located. Let's take a listen. It was reported uh, by the individual's boyfriend um, that Rachel Morin, who's age 37, had, had headed out from her home on Old Emerton Road around 6 p.m. to go to the Ma and Pa Trail. Once she had not returned as and when ex expected, the family was obviously concerned. Initial information from the boyfriend, again, the caller who reported her missing, indicated her car was at the lot at the trailhead here on William Street uh, behind like where Independent Brewery is, the people that are familiar with Bel Air. Um, the car was there, but she was not. The Ma and Pa Trail website has this map of the Bel Air section of the trail. And the website says that the trail winds through wooded, moderately sloped sections through a tunnel underneath Route 24 and alongside North Tollgate Road to its northern point. Now, Rachel's car was located at what's referred to as the William Street entrance near several businesses. Uh, as Joe was just noting, uh, this includes the brewery that the sheriff also mentioned at the press conference as well. Kelly Swoop, I want to go back to you, please. Something that kind of puzzles me is that we hear about this trail being so popular and we know that people were on it that day not just Rachel Morin but I'm curious how this could happen with nobody being around to hear screaming or uh, to possibly stop it could you kind of shed some light on that please well, you know, the, the uh, sheriff has been asked, you know, have there been witnesses? Who have you talked to? Where's, this inf where's the information coming in for? And he's made it very, very clear that there were witnesses in the area, what they saw, what they heard, unclear to us at this point because they're being very tight-lipped about their investigation. But he said that they've interviewed witnesses as well as interviewing the boyfriend. So police, as a, a investigator said, are being very tight-lipped about the information, but there are things going on behind the scenes in terms of what happened, you know, like tracking the phone records, you know, um, trying to find out who was in the area. They, at one point, they were asking people to come forward if they had seen or heard anything, but I think they're kind of dotting all their I's and crossing all their T's to make sure that if they suspect someone, they are building their case with credible information to bring that person in. Exactly, Kelly. Joseph, let me go back to you, please. We know that law enforcement has publicly stated that they're not sure if this was a targeted attack on Rachel Morin or if Rachel Morin just happened to be a random victim of a very violent crime. What are the things that might be indicators of one or the other to law enforcement, please? Well, just to start off first, the police will rarely give out clues of what they know, right? So they always keep things really close to the vest mm -hmm. because they don't want to let certain things leak out into the public because you have people that will inject themselves into the investigation, which then causes more of a problem. However, so some of the things that we that the police department would look at at a scene like this and to say the manner in which this person was, was killed, if there was any weapons used, if that weapon was found at the scene or was it brought to the scene, Different things such as uh, blood spatter, if there if there was a, uh, a vicious attack in that kind of respect. And of course, the most important aspect from an investigative standpoint, as far as I'm concerned, is was the victim sexually assaulted or was it staged to look like a sexual assault? And that's something that the medical examiner will help out with. And also to the forensics experts that have probably combed the scene very carefully, including her clothing and everything else that in and around that area of that crime scene.
I appreciate it, Joseph. Kelly, let me go back to you, please. In terms of these details that we all want to know and investigators are being tight-lipped on, rightfully so, as they should, uh, because solving this crime is really what's most important. Um, have you heard anything else tonight? I just want to make sure, because you and your colleagues have done a tremendous job covering this case on the ground there. Any details at all coming out about what type of weapon might have been used or whether a weapon might have been recovered or any indication of sex assault like Joseph? was wondering about they were very very tight-lipped about that we did have um, a witness that pretty much everybody in town interviewed uh, the interview that was, was in Jeff Hager's story who a man who claimed that he and her, his daughter or his daughter's boyfriend were there that they saw the body that it was very very bloodied and people were very very upset when those details kind of came out into the light that's when the sheriff actually held the social media briefing to say that hey People putting information out there that we don't know if it's true or not is hurtful to the family. It can hinder their investigation. So as far as if that individual was correct, we don't really know at all. So police, again, not wanting to jeopardize their case, not really letting us know a lot about if there, if there was a weapon. You know, I just did hear the chief say that it was a very, very brutal horrible crime. And beyond that, he won't give us much more information. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Kelly. Joseph, back to you. In terms of what can be learned and who it can be learned from, um, we know investigators are saying that they're talking to the peop people closest to Rachel Morin, uh, the people who knew her best. Um, and then, of course, those witnesses, as Kelly mentioned. Um, where else might they be looking? I'm wondering, might they be looking on social media to see if anybody is talking about this? Could there be clues there? Well, most certainly, right? So you always, as an investigation, you always start with the victims, closest relatives and families and husbands and wives and everything else, because why? We are victimized by someone we know most of the time. So investigators always key in upon specifics. So instance, you have a situation where you have a boyfriend, so automatically they are in one of the first people that, it, that the police are interested in in these cases. Well, like I said, why? Because most time we are victimized by this person. So. Investigators will start, I think about it as like a ripple, you throw a rock in the water, you start off real small and then it actually comes out a little further on down the line. They're going to speak to everyone they can and yes, I believe social media can play an important role in this, including internet records, uh, text messages, you name it. Because, and, and not just from the victim standpoint, but also from uh, possible suspects too. Because mm -hmm. as we've known, we've seen in the past in several other cases, people have given themselves up by saying things and doing things on the internet and, and using text messages that they're not really either aware of at the time or they, they regret it much later on during the investigation. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Joseph. We know that Rachel Morin is leaving behind five children, which, which just makes this even more heartbreaking. And people in the community, as soon as they heard a mom is missing, rallied together, were trying to help. Uh, Kelly, in terms of who might have been out there, uh, was it a big showing of support from the community trying to find her at the point when she was still missing and her body hadn't been discovered? Julie was over the weekend and some people did come out and then she was found the next day. Since then, there's been a, a large showing of people in the community trying to rally around the family. There was one memorial that happened, I think, last week, a week before last, but that was not sanctioned by the family. That was actually from a, uh, a lawmaker who wanted to basically let people in the community know that it's going to be okay. We're going to increase security. Everybody's going to be okay. Now the family is actually rallying around to support those five young children. They will be having a memorial walk this weekend. And there is a GoFundMe account set up to help that family. Because like I said, again, this Bel Air community, it is a tight knit community. And for something so horrible and heinous to happen, to happen anywhere is awful, but you just, this is something that you don't necessarily expect to hear about from Bel Air. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, so a very safe area, huh, Kelly? Very safe area, Typically, very family not one oriented. Of our, yeah. yeah. So this is just pretty stunning. Bel Air is not the place you would expect something like this to happen, huh? 
No, definitely not at all. I think that's probably part of the reason why it's blown up so much on social media, as you were mentioning, that the fact that uh, Sheriff Gaylor went to social media just to kind of ease people's fears. This is just, and like I said, the trail is a very, very popular trail that a lot of people walk on, families, children. So this is not a place that you would expect to see something like this occur. Right, Kelly. And I understand that walk that you were mentioning that's going to happen this weekend is going to actually be held on the trail. Is that correct? Yes, at 11 o'clock, 11.30 Saturday morning, they're all going to wear T-shirts. And again, they want to do this to honor Rachel's memory, to also raise money for the family. And like I said, it's, it's just been really, really tough for that area and obviously family and people who knew Rachel because from the post on social media, it would indicate that she was very, very popular, well-loved and well-liked. Oh, that, that makes it even more devastating. Uh, Kelly, thank you for all of that. Uh, Joseph, in terms of what questions you might have tonight, I'm so curious as someone who's done many, many homicide investigations, you've written books on how to do it. Uh, what questions are at the top of your mind this evening, please? Well, the first one that jumps off the page is, were there any complaints about anybody on the trail or was anybody harassed or was anybody attacked? or followed around or anybody that looked odd or out of place. So that would be my first thing that I would be looking at. So for instance, just from an investigative standpoint, when you have situations like this, you always go to what we refer to as a complaint report or an investigative report. And we would then go through all of those instances to see if there is something there that maybe gave a description, maybe that, uh, you know, what, what this person not only looked like, but if they drove a car and, and the like. So that's just something, I think that's just investigative 101 that you would find. And I believe that the police are, were probably on top of that right away. And I also uh, like the fact that the, the both the police chief and I think it was the colonel there too. You know, they came out and pretty much emphatically, you know, saying that you know try not to listen to certain people because uh, he was even saying that the investigators were saying that this person was not even at the crime scene. So we have to be really careful about that kind of material that gets released on there. And it could, could hurt your investigation in regards to the tip line where you're getting just inundated with things. We've seen this now over and over again in the last couple of major investigations. Uh, the true crime community, it can do a lot of good, but mm -hmm. there are some within it that can also bog down an investigation, and we saw that. So, you know, the one thing I like to see, I, I, I'm not sure, I, I might have missed it, but maybe a Crime Stoppers reward or some other type of, uh, you know, investigative clues out there to, to get people to come forward with something has anybody you know looked like there was injuries because um you know this this woman seemed to be in pretty good shape she's out jogging on a trail so mm -hmm. the likelihood is fighting back maybe she scratched the uh, assailant right so we, we might have finger nails there's a whole bunch of things that we don't know but i think there are things that the investigators have and that they we won't know until they you know make an arrest and i i, I believe I, listen i have confidence that they are because uh when you're seeing that 10 people are on this you're seeing that the chief and everybody they're using social media they're actually going out there and engaging people but i think that uh they have they are zoning in on a, a particular person by now mm -hmm. i i always say it on the show uh Police are always further along than they let the public know, and for good reason. And I'm glad you mentioned that tonight, Joseph. Uh, we all hope that they are very close to solving this case and getting justice for Rachel Morin's family. I want to say a big thank you to WMAR anchor Kelly Swoop for coming on the program tonight. Kelly, thank you so much, and we'll continue thank to stay in close touch uh, with you and your colleagues at the station for any new developments. Take good care. And Detective Joseph Jackalone is going to stay with us. We have to hit a break, folks. Before we do that, we've got a preview for you of what is coming up next tonight here on Closing Arguments. On this hour of Closing Arguments, the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students is preparing for trial. Brian Koberger is first expected at a hearing this week, and we have a preview. If you just go to bed at night and somebody can come and get you, there's no way to be safe, you know. There's no way to be safe to be able to prevent somebody from stalking. So that's not the answer. The answer is, you know, eliminating these people and, and removing them from society. A man married six times. Four of his wives died under mysterious circumstances. 
eccentric widower Thomas Randolph. Charged with the murders of his wife and the man he allegedly paid to kill her. A 2017 conviction overturned. The plan between Mr. Miller and Mr. Randolph was to kill Sharon. Now he faces a jury once again. The Widower Murder Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. After Advil dual action back pain. Yo, ooh, ha, ha. What? My back feels better. Before Advil. Oh. New Advil dual action back pain. Fights back pain two ways for eight hours of reversed. Oh, so that was who we were just talking about, Michael Gabrzeski. So he's the guy who claims that he found Rachel Morin's body the day after she disappeared. Gabrzeski spoke to several different news outlets about it, claiming that Rachel Morin had severe head trauma and might have been hit with a rock or hit with a baseball bat. But this morning, our Julia Janae spoke with the Hadford County Chief Deputy. His name's William Davis, and he says the Sheriff's Office does not buy Mr. Gabrzeski's claims. The individual that was uh, on the news, and he's been on many news outlets talking about what he saw at the crime scene, um, our investigators have confirmed that he never saw the crime scene and he never saw the body of Rachel Moore. And so anything you've heard from him, you just, you just got to discount everything that he said that's out there. Because as I've said before in, on other uh, media outlets that it's very important for an investigation like this that the only people that know the, what that crime scene looked like is the actual killer and our detectives. So that when we finally do narrow it down and catch a suspect, that we make sure we get the right person. That's right. You know, it makes you wonder, why do people have to do stuff like that? Does that bug you? It really bugs me. Let me bring in my guest still with me, retired NYPD Sergeant Joseph Jackalone. And joining us from Indianapolis, the co-host of the Murder Sheet podcast, Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee. Anya and Kevin, welcome to you both. We were just talking about this guy a couple of minutes ago. Uh, and, and Joseph, you know, when you hear about these people that do this, in your years of doing investigations, I'm sure you've come across them. They say they saw something that they didn't see. They claim to be in a place where they never were and then people like us who really want to know the true facts are wondering why why do these people insert themselves through your experience what have you found to be the case well when you're dealing with a high profile case specifically you have people that that want that 15 minutes of fame so to speak mm. so it's much different today than it was when i was doing this a long time ago because now the internet and everything else can make somebody famous within the matter of minutes and it's just something that happens uh, you know, many times in these high-profile cases. And sometimes you're going to you get you get people that will actually tell tell you know confess to the crime. I mean, just because once once again they want to be famous in that respect. That's why when the colonel said about there are certain things that only the killer knows and that the police know. And that's very important because the day comes when there is an interrogation. They can ask specific questions to this individual, and they'll know right away if this person was was at the scene or he or he wasn't at the scene mm -hmm. hope he didn't make any TikToks uh that uh are going viral on this uh, especially after the sheriff's department saying he's not credible don't listen to it uh so what i want to know anya and kevin is what you two want to know you both are very um well versed in conversations happening in the true crime community the cases that are making headlines uh, and this one is the one that seems to be grabbing the attention of people all over the world, just not in the United States. Uh, let's talk about where the conversation is, what people want to know about, what they're saying. Uh, ladies first, please, Anya, let me go to you to start us off. Absolutely, and thanks so much for having us sure. on. Um, I would say that um, one thing we really want to know and one thing that we've seen that other observers of this case want to know is, is this a stranger killing? Was this some predator lying in wait who took advantage of the fact that Rachel was alone? Or is this a situation where somebody who knew her may have wanted to do her harm? That to us is fundamentally one of those huge questions in the case. And I think it's just something that we're going to wait to see um, as it rolls out, what law enforcement is doing and, you know, if any arrests are made quickly or um, whatnot. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, according to the sheriff, Rachel Morin's boyfriend, his name is Richard Tobin, was the one who reported her missing, left a lot of people wondering if he had any involvement in her disappearance or her death, and he responded to the speculation uh, with a comment on his Facebook page. I want to show that to you now, saying, quote, I love Rachel. I would never do anything to her. Let her family and I grieve. Yes, I have a past, but I also have 15 months clean and have changed as a person Please. Now, this morning, during her interview with the Hartford County Chief Deputy, our Julia Janae, asked if Rachel's boyfriend is being looked at as a suspect. Here's what the chief said. I wouldn't say that there's anybody that really isn't a suspect at this time, but he has been very cooperative and he's willing to talk to us anytime we ask him to. Okay, so uh, that answer is about as clear as mud, right? Let me bring back in my guests. Uh, Kevin Greenlee, let me go to you on this one. You know, he's, he's not going so far as to say the guy's in the clear, uh, but he's not implicating him either. Uh, what questions do you have, please, about uh, the boyfriend? Because I understand when he's talking about his past, it's a past with an assaultive history. Uh, he's got a record that includes assaultive behavior. So, of course, that raises some eyebrows, doesn't it? Yeah, it does certainly raise some eyebrows. But I, I remember I was talking to an investigator once. He said, basically, the only way you can clear someone is by convicting someone else. And as far as we know, despite his criminal history, there's no specific reason to suspect he may have been involved in this awful murder. Uh, he mentioned he's been clean and sober for 15 months. I know he's been participating in a drug court. And those are programs that really keep a close eye on people. So you have a lot of eyes on him, making sure he stays on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and if he is participating in that program, then he would be under the jurisdiction of the court, you know, meaning that if there is a violation of probation, the judge could violate uh, him and potentially send him back uh, to prison, resentence him on the case. Uh, so uh, that's a really good point, Kevin. Thank you for that. Uh, he's being watched closely. Uh, and they're not coming out and saying uh, that, that he is uh, under a cloud of suspicion. They're just kind of being vague. Uh, Joseph Jack alone uh, tell me what you think about the boyfriend so he's got an assaultive past but he is the one who did report Rachel Morin missing I uh, was the one who was initially concerned it was that night when she didn't come home from her exercising on the trail uh, what do you think about this guy what would you want to know about him please Well, one of the first things that investigators would do would go right to their computers and start running running this individual for which well, again you know what kind of arrest history he has and any other types of uh, instances that he might have had with law enforcement. But you know what, when you look at the, he had an assault charge, he had a, like a, like a, almost like a, I think it was like a weapons charge kind of thing. It could all stem from one incident, right? He could have gotten, let's say, to a bar fight and hit somebody with a, with a beer bottle or something like that. So unless we know a little bit more about that, one doesn't say, all right, we go from, uh, you know, a fight with this and, you know, then we jump to murder. So we have to be really careful. And, and this is something I wish the true crime community would also Take, take heat on, right? So you, you can't put this kind of pressure on people and you, without uh, without actual information. We, you can't speculate. You can't accuse people. And it's just something that can, you know, end up, you know, hurting the investigation in regards to the police are, are now answering out true, the true crime community and some of these things. I mean, even the chief has said, with well, a question we get all the time is, have we spoken to the boyfriend? You know, uh, that that's investigative one on one. I tell you, if they didn't speak to the boyfriend, I think they should all turn in their badges and, yes. and leave. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's just something that. Yeah, I mean, that's just something that it's a guarantee that happened. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Here's the deal. There are ways that police now have they have tools that can tell you where you are. Right. So that cell phone in your pocket mm -hmm. or that smartwatch on your wrist, wherever it's tracking you, wherever you go. So they might have had some information to tell. You know, to tell the police that he was at a specific location or he has a, an alibi for that. But just because the police say you are not a suspect or they even say he's been cleared or that person's been cleared, it means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it, Joe. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hit a break, but all of our guests are going to stay with us on the program. We have lots more questions for them coming up. And when we come back, we're going to tackle the question, who was Rachel Marin? We've got more on her coming up after the break. There was pounding on the door. Bang, bang, bang. 
He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived tonight, 10, 9 central on Court TV. A delivery driver shot at while working. They shot several times that man trying to kill Mr. Gibson. Now, a father and son stand trial for attempted murder. The FedEx driver shooting trial. Live coverage weekday mornings only on Court TV. Thanks for being with us here on Closing Arguments. We are still waiting to hear more about Rachel Morin's life. Here's what we know so far, though. We know that she was a mother to five children. She's also a daughter and a beloved sister. And we're now learning that she was also a business owner. The New York Post is reporting that Rachel Morin had her own cleaning company. The Post speaking to one of Morin's clients about what she was like. The client telling them, quote, she was very warm and above all, she loved her children. She raised them very well. She had a flexible work schedule that allowed her to make sure her kids were always taken care of. We were like grandparents to the kids and we trusted her implicitly, end quote. The New York Post also reporting tonight that Rachel Morin kept a daily spray tan appointment and frequented multiple dating sites as well before her gruesome death. Uh, so tragic, leaving those five children behind. Now they are without a mother. Their lives changed forever, and hopefully soon this mystery will be solved. I want to bring back in my guests uh, still with me. Detective, retired NYPD sergeant, and the author of two books uh, on homicides, Joseph Jackalone is with us, and the co-host of the Murder Sheet podcast, Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee with us tonight as well. Anya and Kevin, uh, you two know the Delphi case so well. You've come on Court TV Network many times, uh, shared so much knowledge and great insight about it. And earlier today, when I was talking to my colleagues about this, we were preparing for the show tonight, I said, I keep thinking about the Delphi case. I, I know these facts are very different, but there's just something about this that's making me think Delphi. And I wanted to ask you, and Anya, I see you nodding, so let me go to you first, please. Did you get any uh, feeling that this strikes you as somewhat similar to that too? It's a great question. Um, that's actually what drew our interest initially in this case. Um, and, and to be very clear, these similarities are very likely just superficial, uh, meaning that there's no underlying connection. It doesn't necessarily mean that the crime even took place in a similar way. But the fact that this took place in a rails to trail setting, where the Ma and Pa Trail is this popular place for people in the community to come jog, walk, and enjoy joy nature. Um, the fact that it happened when this um, this lady, uh, Rachel Morin, is doing an activity that everyone should be able to do safely, going on an evening jog or walk, that just reminded us a bit of Delphi, where, of course, you have two teenage girls in broad daylight going on another rails to trail, um, basically setting with the Monon High Bridge, the Monon Trails in that case in Indiana. And it just struck us as that is something that's terrifying to a community. As, as one of the guests said earlier, I mean, this is something that everyone wants to be able to enjoy these, these park spaces, these green spaces. And when some tragedy like this happens, it's just terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. As she was saying, the Bel Air area is an area known to be very safe. It's just stunning to everyone that something like this would happen. Um, very much like the situation in, in Delphi. It is when, you know, we're talking about, you know, a daylight hike, you know, and in the Delphi case, we have two people together, you know, um, Joseph, Jack alone, let me go to you on this. When we think of safety and what we should do, uh, you know, you always say, oh, go in pairs, go with someone else. Well, in that case, you know, we had two people killed, albeit children, but still uh, two people killed here, one person killed. Um, what should we take away in terms of what to know about safety? And if, if one does want to go for a hike outdoors, um, what kind of precautions could they take, please, Joe? Well, my best advice is to be aware of your surroundings and probably the most distracting thing that we have with us today is your cell phone or, you know, playing your music, having your, you know, AirPods in or your, you know, whatever type of device you're listening in on as you're running or walking. You really can't hear what's going on if somebody comes up from behind you and what have you. 
So that's just something. And yes, going with pairs is always, or even you know, a larger group is is always safer. Nothing's foolproof, unfortunately. And we've seen a number of these incidents across the country where women have been attacked, you know, on these uh, on trails, right? So, like we had the uh, Karina Vetrano in New York City in Queens. You had um, uh, Miss Fletcher in I think it was Memphis, Tennessee, Eliza Fletcher. So you had some other you know terrible instances on these trails because. You know, people are, are go there to you know to enjoy themselves and and kind of relax and and they kind of let their guard down. I think sometimes and unfortunately, you know, we we can't afford to do that in this day and age. That you just can't go and enjoy yourself, and it's a shame. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate what you said. You know about having uh, the headphones in, the AirPods in, whatever you use. It is very hard to hear when you do have them in, and so you wonder if that's something we can eliminate as a as a possible distraction and to help us be a little more safe when we're out and about. Uh, Kevin Greenlee, let me go to you, please, uh, on a point that's really disturbing. We know that there's a GoFundMe for those five children who are left behind without their mom. And it's Rachel Morin's sister who established it. And she said something to the effect that her sister didn't go willingly, you know, indicating to us that she may have fought for her life. She very well may have put up a tremendous fight. Joseph made the point earlier that somebody could be badly injured because she looks like she was in great shape. Um, are you hearing anything, you know, in, in the folks that are that are talking uh, in the true crime community about this, your listeners uh, on the podcast, anything that might indicate that this was um, an attack, you know, perhaps by, you know, someone, a stranger, someone not known to her that might have caught her off guard? Really, we don't know. It's just a matter of speculation. I think uh, the fact of the matter is even the police at this time aren't aware of whether it's a stranger situation or if it was targeted. If it was a random situation, you'd want to look at naturally at, have there been other incidents like this on the park? Have there been attacks or have women felt harassed? And if you wanted to try to figure out if this was somehow targeted towards this woman, you'd have to be start looking at her own life. Uh, are there, is there anybody in her life who has some sort of a grudge against her? Is there anybody who would know that she would be out alone at this time? And of course, everybody I've talked to about this case, uh, over and above the circumstances of who's responsible. It's just heartbreaking to think of all of the people affected by this and those five poor children who no longer have a mother. Absolutely. Well said, Kevin. Kevin Greenlee, Anya Kane, the host of the Murder Sheet podcast. Great to have you on the show. And retired NYPD Sergeant Joseph Jackalone, wonderful to have you and all of your insight as well. Thank you all for being on the program tonight. Hope to see you back here very soon.